Hello, my name is Dr. Mickey Yurde, and glad to have an opportunity to tell you a story that I hope you'll find amusing. I think many of us remember the company Theranos not too very long ago that was very prominent in the news and all the things that didn't go too well for them. But I'm here to talk about something that's much earlier, more than 100 years ago. There was a system called the Dynamizer, which I think you'll find interesting. The key figure is a person named Albert Abrams. He was in San Francisco, lived here from his birth in 1863 till he died in 1924. He became a medical physician, got his medical degree at 20 years old in 1883. In the early 1900s, Dr. Abrams actually was a fairly well-known expert in neurology. But as time went on, he started getting some rather peculiar ideas about what was important medically and what was not. He came to believe that electrons were the most important thing in medicine. And he had what he called the electronic reactions of Abrams, or the ERAs. He had a bit of an ego as well. These ERAs were something he felt were going to be very important for diagnosis and eventually for therapeutics. So he invented a number of instruments that were related to this, this notion of electrons being important one of which was called the dynamizer. And the dynamizer was an instrument that was supposed to be able to detect any disease state in a person. It supposedly would be able to read these ERA vibrations. And he could use initially a drop of blood, he said, to detect virtually any disease. And later, he added handwriting. So he just had to submit a, a, a bit of handwriting and he could analyze anything. The way it, it worked was that once the instrument was given the sample of blood or the paper, Dr. Abrams would connect an electrode to the head of a lab tech that was there with him. That lab tech would then strip down to the waist and Dr. Abrams would, would percuss him and listen for the vibrations. And from that, he thought he could diagnose these diseases. Initially, it was all the material that had to be sent to him to process. Later, he decided that uh, he could do it by telephone. So became one of the first advocates of telehealth. This became very popular. It was something that physicians could lease for $200 a year. They could then maintain that lease for $5 a month. And, you know, back in those days, that $200 was equivalent to about $3,000 today. So about a 15-fold difference. He then became very interested in the possibility of actually curing those diseases as well. And he created another of his instruments called the oscilloclast. The oscilloclast came with a set of frequency tables, and you would be able to read through them and find the attack frequency of any particular disease state, so he said. And people would use this in their practice. So by 1921, he had over 3,500 people that had bought these systems and were using them. You might imagine not everyone in the medical community was willing to believe in his claims, and many were just outright incredulous, and they started to actually send samples to him to see what he could do. And many of them sent animal blood samples to him. And they were quite amused when a sheep was uh, diagnosed with hereditary syphilis and a rooster was uh, diagnosed with uh, sinus problems and also bad teeth. That, uh, that wasn't quite appropriate. But he had many defenders, such as the famous author of The Jungle, Upton Sinclair, and the man who wrote all the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And then Scientific American started receiving letters from people indicating that they thought this was one of the greatest medical inventions of all time, this whole system. So they became a little concerned about this and decided to investigate it. They investigated it by hiring a fellow they called Dr. X. I don't know what they actually called him, but that's what it is in all the, the write-ups. And Dr. X worked with a number of physicians to develop six tubes that he was going to take to Abrams and have him use his magic to discover what it contained. So there were six unknown pathogens to Abrams. Dr. X was permitted to come and watch this by Abrams. He rather befriended the guy and he used it. He gave back the results to Dr. X and Dr. X said, sorry, they're all wrong. I uh, didn't get one of them right. And Abrams took a look at this result and he said, oh, you know what? I didn't notice, but you have red ink labels on these tubes and uh, that interferes with the ERA. So uh, that's probably what the problem was. Scientific American did finally publish those results. Many people, you know, didn't believe it. They continued to use the system for years to come. After Abrams finally died in 1924, the FDA actually sent some people out to open up some of those instruments. The lease to the dynamizer came with a clause that you had to sign indicating that you would not open the instrument. And if you did, it would, in fact, disturb the, the performance of the tests. So people evidently did not for many, many years. At least nobody had reported that they had. 
So the FDA sent some people out to open up some of these instruments and look inside, and they found that they were not all the same. Some had magnetic coils in them, but many of them actually had disarticulated parts that were never connected together. So they, they really couldn't have worked and didn't work. So this went on for many years and uh, fooled a lot of people, unfortunately. This story, which I had read many years ago, just sort of came back to me when I heard the story about Theranos and uh, the fact that some very well-known people had been fooled by this for a very long time and it took a long time to reveal what the problems were. I think one of the lessons learned from, from this particular case and now with Theranos is that people should be considerably more careful and skeptical in terms of the claims made about such incredible devices. It just was too good to be true. So hopefully from lessons like that of the Dynamizer and that of the Theranos story, we've learned that it's probably important for all of us to be a bit more skeptical about unusual claims. Carl Sagan once said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And uh, I think we didn't quite have extraordinary evidence in either case. So this is Mickey Day. Thank you very much for listening. And we'll be back to the not too distant future with more interesting stories in the history of diagnostics.